It can be dangerous to be curious. Forgoing cliches about what killed the cat, curiosity has led to the death of many of scientists. This week's video is one of these stories. In 1957, a herpetologist's optimism and devotion to his studies led him to personally record the symptoms he experienced after being bitten by a small green snake in the Chicago Field Museum of Natural History. The local newspaper would later call these notes a snake bite death diary. These notes belong to Dr. Carl Patterson Schmidt, but what is so strange is he was a snake expert and an accomplished herpetologist. In his life, he had published over 150 papers on herpetology and had named at least 200 reptiles. So why on September 25th, 1957, did Carl grab a snake he knew to be venomous? Why didn't he seek any medical care after the bite? And how did he die from a single fang prick from a juvenile snake that was widely believed to be only mildly venomous? Well, luckily, we have a collection of notes directly from the source, and today we are going to read Carl's account of everything he experienced up until his death in an effort to understand what killed Carl Patterson Schmidt. Carl Patterson Schmidt was born in Lake Forest, Illinois in 1890 and turned out a lot better than the other Carl Schmidt that was born two years earlier in Germany. I bring this up because depending on how you spell his name, you will find two very different Wikipedia pages. But all you need to know today is I am talking about the Carl with a K, even though it would have been preferable for Carl with a C to have died in this manner. Our Carl's story really begins in 1916, where he first worked as a herpetology assistant at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. This role eventually led Carl to his first of many specimen collecting expeditions when he was 29. This first trip was to Puerto Rico, but over the course of his life, he would go on collecting expeditions to Honduras, Brazil, Guatemala, Peru, and Israel. But despite all those excursions, Carl's not known for many true new discoveries, but one source did refer to him as the most productive herpetologist of his time. In 1922, he began his career at the Field Museum in Chicago, where he would name over 200 species and become one of the world's leading experts on coral snakes. Carl did more than just collect and name specimens for the Field Museum, though. He also collected scientific literature for the Field Museum that had not yet been translated into English. In 1937, Carl helped translate a German book called Ecological Animal Geography to English at a time where not having an English translation didn't mean you had to read some rough Google Translate outputs. It meant the knowledge in those books just was not available to people who did not speak the language. Carl also was responsible for some original publications, including a book you can still find copies of today called The Field Guide of Snakes of the United States and Canada. Shortly after this publication, Carl was promoted to the chief curator of zoology at the Field Museum in 1941 and was made the president of the American Society of Ichthyologists and Herpetologists in 1942. The now 52-year-old Carl would still go on to co-author an ecology textbook and become known as the man that turned herpetology from a hobby into a serious branch of biology. So in a way, Carl was kind of the father of herpetology as a serious academic pursuit. Although the title of the father of herpetology is usually given to John Edwards Holbrook. By the way, let me know if a video on John Holbrook, the father of herpetology, sounds interesting to you. Now, many more publications, achievements, and contributions to the field of herpetology later. Let's flash forward to 1955 when Carl retires but continues volunteering as the curator emeritus of zoology at the Chicago Field Museum. This is what Carl was still doing on that fateful day in late September of 1957. The Lincoln Park Zoo had received a young, spindly, 26-inch long snake from Africa and were unsure of the species. Mr. Truitt of the Lincoln Park Zoo decided to bring the snake to Carl at the Field Museum to get an expert's opinion on what the snake could be. The snake in question looked like a venomous colubrid known as the Wumslang. It had the characteristic head shape, oblique and keeled scales, and bright color pattern of the Wumslang. But there was one problem. At the time, keys used to identify Wumslangs described them as having a divided anal scale, and this snake had an undivided anal plate. After being bitten, Carl would know that this unusual feature would have prevented any key in use at the time from identifying the snake as a Wumslang. This detail may have been why Carl grabbed the snake in the way he did, Inexplicably to Carl's colleagues, he reached for the snake, which was being safely restrained by another curator, just as they were discussing the possibility of the snake being a venomous Wormsling. Carl wrote that he attempted to take the snake from Dr. Inger without thinking of any precaution. Carl didn't know it yet, but that moment of lapsed judgment would cost him his life. The snake quickly turned on Carl and bit him in the fleshy part of his left thumb just before the first joint. Although Wormslings are rear fanged and this one was small, it was able to open its mouth widely enough to sink one of its fangs a full three millimeters into Carl's thumb. Besides the fang that punctured Carl's thumb, only one other tooth seemed to have punctured his skin. When the snake finally released, Carl began bleeding from both punctures and immediately began sucking on the wound. 
This is where I would like to interject that this was a horrible idea and is really a sign of the times that one of the world's most prominent herpetologists would attempt to suck the venom out of a snake bite. For anyone watching this who may one day experience a venomous snake bite, do not try to suck out the venom. This is just as silly as if you... I don't know, went and got a flu shot and then tried sucking your flu shot out. Once something has been injected into your tissues, there is no way to suck it back out and you are introducing a much higher risk for a secondary infection by putting your filthy mouth on a fresh wound. Nothing against you, mouths are just filthy in general. As we will soon hear, this attempt at sucking out the venom did not work for Carl. So this marks the beginning of Carl's own account of the effects of the boom slang venom. But there is one last thing you need to know. Carl did not write this from a hospital bed and would not be capable of writing by the time he eventually was brought to the hospital. Which is why this first entry was written on the train ride home from work. 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. Strong nausea, but without vomiting. During a trip homeward, went on suburban train. 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. Strong chill and shaking followed by fever of 101.7. Bleeding of the mucous membranes in the mouth began about 5.30. Apparently, mostly from the gums. So now Carl is just calmly recording the fact that he has started bleeding from his gums only a few hours after a snake bite that he knew to be venomous. Wild. Absolutely wild. 8.30 p.m. Ate two pieces of milk toast. 9 p.m. to 12.20 a.m. Slept well. Urination at 12.20 a.m. Mostly blood, but a small amount. Could tell that the mouth had been bleeding steadily from dried blood at both angles of mouth. After taking these notes, Carl attempted to get back to sleep. He tossed and turned until 4 a.m. when he tried to relieve the abdominal pain he was experiencing with an enema. 4.30 a.m. Took a glass of water, followed by violent nausea and vomiting the contents of the stomach, which was his undigested supper from the night before. Carl notes that this made him feel much better, and he got back to sleep until 6.30 a.m. September 26, 6.30 a.m. Temperature, 98.2. Ate cereal and poached eggs on toast, applesauce, and coffee for breakfast at 7.00. Note, slight bleeding is now going on in the bowels with frequent bleeding at the anus. No urine was produced, but I'm peeing an ounce or so of blood about every three hours. Mouth and nose continue to bleed, not excessively. Despite the numerous concerning symptoms, after breakfast, Carl was reportedly feeling much better and began behaving normally. Probably excited that the worst was behind him, Carl was feeling well enough by 10 a.m. to inform his colleagues and friends that he was feeling well and would most likely be back to work at the museum in a day's time. The 6.30 a.m. note was even the last detail he felt the need to personally record. It appeared that Carl had survived the worst of his ordeal and would get to add a first-hand account of the effects of an untreated boomslang bite to the scientific literature. Adding just one more accomplishment to his long list of already impressive accomplishments, Sadly, his contribution of the description of an untreated boom sling bite would play out, but Carl would not live to see its publication. Carl had lunch around noon and began feeling nauseous and vomited soon after. This is when Carl began to feel short of breath. Eventually, his labored breathing grew so loud that it could be heard throughout the whole house. Hearing all the trouble Carl was having breathing, finally his wife, Margaret, called the inhaler squad and the family doctor. Oh yeah, Carl has a wife that apparently let him bleed all over the house for almost a day before calling the doctors. Uh, there are some reports that she did plea with Carl to go to the doctor, to which Carl allegedly replied he couldn't do that because their treatments would interrupt the symptoms he was trying to study. While this interaction fits the image of a mad but dedicated scientist studying reptiles even with his last breath and adds to the legend of the snakebite death diary, I could not find any proof that this exchange actually happened. I include it here because it does come up in a few articles about Carl's death, but again, I don't know what primary source this detail comes from and could not verify it for this video, so maybe take that detail with a grain of salt. Anyway, by the time first responders arrived, attempts were made to resuscitate Carl, and although color did return to his hands and face, the briefly improved condition would not last long. In truth, any chance to help Carl had already passed. At the age of 67, Carl Patterson Schmidt would be pronounced dead. When he arrived at the hospital just before 3 p.m., less than 24 hours from the first entry in what was now his death journal. So what the heck happened and how did the... Oh, sorry, spot. All right, I think he's done rattling. So what the heck happened and how did an expert herpetologist end up dying from what many Americans believed at the time to be only a mildly venomous snake bite? Well, one contributor to his death was certainly the carelessness that led him to grab the boom slang how he did. A kind of funny line in the article his death notes were published in stated, any herpetologist knows that if he wants to be bitten deeply, 
all he has to do is grip a snake a short distance behind the head. And this is absolutely true. I have worked with everything from mambas and cobras to kaboom vipers and rattlesnakes. Heck, I've even worked with bone slings. And despite all the differences between those snakes, grabbing any of them or restraining them in any way near the neck is one of the worst things you can do and the easiest way to provoke a bite. Carl would have known this, and this momentary lapse in judgment was definitely one factor that led to his death. But a venomous snake bite does not have to be a death sentence, and antivenom had been invented by this time, so was it Carl's arrogance or a desire to personally document the venom's effects that led to his death? Possibly. Others have speculated that perhaps Carl knew there was no specific bloomsling antivenom in the U.S. that could help him in Chicago. It could have been possible that Carl resigned himself to his fate knowing antivenom either did not exist or was too far out of reach to be of any help. Proponents of this theory often commend Carl as a committed herpetologist that accepted his fate and chose to spend his last hours of life doing what he had committed his life to and add to the body of knowledge on reptiles one last time. While this makes for a grim but inspiring story, it does not exactly check out. Clifford H. Hope, the man that eventually published Carl's death notes and was present at the time of his fatal bite, seemed to think it was simply Carl's curious and optimistic spirit that led him to document his death. Carl believed he would survive this bite, and to his credit, Clifford Pope pointed out that the Blumslang was very young and Carl was only envenomated deeply by one fang. Many Americans also had the misconception that Blumslangs, like other rear fang colubrids, were only mildly venomous. A lot of Americans also call them boomslings and not womslings, and I don't even know if womslings is correct, uh, but if you are a South African herper, uh, let me know how I did on my pronunciation in the comments. I tried not to just give in and go with the American boomslang. I don't know. Maybe I'll just end up having the South Africans and the Americans laugh at me. Anyway, back to Americans thinking that the womslings were only mildly venomous. These facts could lead an optimistic person like Carl to believe he would be able to withstand the bite, but even if Carl had put the pen down and sought medical attention, would it have changed anything? Although Carl could not have known this at the time, a paper published in 2017 examining the venom of the womsling and exploring whether the North American viper antivenom Crofab could immunocapture womsling venom proteins determined womsling venom was made up of proteins belonging to several familiar protein families including PLA2s, three-finger toxins, serin protease, and snake venom metalloprotease, or SVMPs. This research also determined that the North American viper antivenom, Crofab, was able to efficiently capture some of the Wormsling's SVMPs. This 2017 paper went on to conclude that through antivenomic analysis, it appears that the antivenom available at the time of Carl's death likely would have been able to help him. But fat lot of good that does him. These findings came about 70 years too late for Carl. Unfortunately, the other findings that spelled out Carl's fate were published almost 20 years before his death and could have informed him going home after the bite was not a wise decision. Clifford Pope points out that in 1940, E. Gresset and A. W. Shasma published a thorough investigation on the venom of the Bormslang and concluded that its venom surpassed cobras, crates, and mambas in toxicity. It also found that antivenoms created for neurotoxic snakes of Africa were not effective at neutralizing Bormslang venom and that better results were had by using puff adder and other viper antivenoms. This information could have led to attempting treatment with the antivenoms available at the time of Carl's death. Something that the 2017 research revealed through venomic analysis could have improved Carl's condition. Although the 1940 Blumslang research was known to Clifford Pope at the time of publishing Carl's death diary, it was unclear if Clifford or Carl personally knew of this South African research at the time of Carl's death, which seems like an especially ironic detail in the death of someone who spent a considerable amount of his herpetological career translating academic works and helping to spread German zoological knowledge to America. And I can't help but wonder if the South African Wormslang research had been more well known in the US, if Carl's fate might have been different. But it's too late for all that now, so what did the coroner have to say? The autopsy revealed extensive internal bleeding. Hemorrhages were found in his small intestines and colon, measuring one to five centimeters, which explains his abdominal pain and bloody stool. His bladder contained hemorrhagic urine that resembled pure blood. But even more concerning, there was bleeding on both the right and left hemispheres of Carl's brain, as well as a large hemorrhage over the cerebellum. Smaller hemorrhages were also found on the blood supply to Carl's eyes. Ultimately, hemorrhages were found in the brain, small intestines, kidneys, heart, eyes, and lungs. The cause of death was eventually blamed on the cerebral hemorrhaging described earlier, but this was incorrect. Clifford notes that some of the hemorrhages could have occurred post-mortem, as the autopsy was not performed until 18 hours after Carl's death. 
Clifford therefore proposed that the most likely cause of death was not the hemorrhaging, but blood clots in the lungs that caused Carl to asphyxiate. This would explain the shortness of breath and the difficulty breathing that Carl experienced immediately before succumbing to the venom. If the blood supply can't travel through the lungs, it does not matter how much air you inhale, your lungs can no longer absorb or deliver oxygen to the rest of the body. Not surprisingly, in the 2017 paper investigating Wormsling venom at Carl's death, researchers agreed that Carl likely died from dick. Well, dick-like syndrome anyway. Disseminated intravascular coagulation, abbreviated DIC and sometimes called venom-induced consumption coagulopathy in cases like this, is when your blood veins become blocked with clots throughout the body. Wormsling venom does this by hacking your body's response to being injured. Normally, when we are cut, our bodies release a clotting enzyme called serin protease thrombin in the specific area where you are bleeding from. The thrombin then converts a protein in the blood called fibrinogen into fibrin. This is what causes our blood to clot and prevents us from bleeding to death from paper cuts. This is fine and good when our body is deciding where the thrombin needs to be released, but after the bite of a boomslang, the serin protease, or SP, and the snake venom metalloproteases, SVMPs, in the venom acts like our bodies naturally produce serin protease thrombin and converts all of the fibrinogen in your blood to fibrin, causing massive and widespread blood clots throughout the body. Essentially, your blood gets triggered into thinking you are bleeding everywhere and it needs to clot to save your life. But don't worry, this can't go on forever because fibrinogen is a soluble protein found in the blood that we only have so much of, and once it has all been converted into insoluble fibrin, you will stop uncontrollably clotting. Unfortunately, your blood will lose all ability to clot, which is very bad because by this time the SVMPs in the venom has ripped through your cells and caused widespread hemorrhaging throughout the body. This explains why Carl recorded bleeding from his, um, everything, and why the autopsy reveals so much widespread internal hemorrhaging. This is why Clifford Pope, the 2017 research article, and many other Wormsling venom studies and case reports list DIC as the final cause of death, and not the brain hemorrhaging the autopsy originally thought caused Carl's death. So yes, Boomsling venom will make you bleed from your everything, and untreated will eventually cause you to bleed out internally, but the good news is, all the blood clots also caused by the venom will probably kill you first. Man, good news about snake venom really sucks. Anyway, 55 years after the death of the great herpetologist Carl Patterson Schmidt, Boomsling venom is fairly well understood. There is always more research to be done and more questions to answer, but there is now a very effective Boomsling monovalent antivenom that alongside blood transfusions can save a bite victim with as little as one to two vials of antivenom. There is always more research to be done and more questions to answer, but there is now a very effective Wormsling monovalent antivenom that alongside blood transfusions can save a bite victim with as little as one to two vials of antivenom. Like Carl's larger herpetological career, his death notes did not produce any new discoveries. They did, however, highlight Carl's curiosity and dedication to herpetology up until the final hours of his life. His story also serves as a powerful reminder to anyone that studies or works with venomous animals or dangerous animals of any kind that just one moment of carelessness can be fatal. Why did Carl grab the Wormsling in the way he did? Was he aware of the 17-year-old research that both identified Wormslings as one of the most toxic snakes in all of Africa and suggested the possibility of viper antivenom being a viable treatment? Or was it his optimism and the common perception that Wormslings were just a mildly venomous colubrid that led him to act hastily and for no treatment? We might never know the answer to these questions, but I have done my best to compile all the details I could find here in a way I hope you enjoyed. There are links to all of my sources in the description for anyone who wants to dive further into this topic, and I would love to hear your thoughts and theories in the comments, and will do my best to respond to all of you. So thank you for watching this week's video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to subscribe for next week's video on reports of man-eating pythons, and be sure to check out last week's video on the world's scariest venoms if you missed it. I'll link both those videos on the end screen and in the description below. And with that, thank you so much for watching this video until the end, and I owe an extra big thank you to my head herpers over on Patreon that support this channel at the highest level every month. Thank you, Amanda Lynn, Bobby Cromer, Deborah Torgerson, Lavenders, Lindsay Justice, and my newest head herper, Tiffany H. I could not do this without you, and I'm so grateful for your support, along with all the support of the other helpful herpers and herpet hippies scrolling down your screen now. If you would like to join this list of fantastic individuals keeping this channel going, you can sign up at the link in the description to support this channel and get your name in the end credits of every full video for just $3 a month. Anyway, thank you again for watching. I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. I hope none of you have to record the details of your own death, but most of all, I hope that you just keep herping.